Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning as we gather here to praise our God. And especially, well, the sun was shining last week, it's shining again, and the temperature got warmer. Amen. Uh, We are here this morning to worship our God, who is over all things. And I wanted to start by reminding us of something that is so vital to our walk of faith, so vital for each and every one of you who are here. So make sure you listen. This is important. It's from, uh, I want to read this, Galatians 3, verses 26 through 28. It says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this is important. We'll talk about it throughout the service today, but I want to remind us, God wants to remind us this, I love this line, that you have clothed yourselves in Christ. And what that means is that you have put on Christ. You are, you are it's, it, literally, it's like you are wearing Jesus. And the thing is that when you wear Jesus, when God looks at you and when, when we look at each other, that's what we should see first. That is what God sees. And that's why we are forgiven because he doesn't see our sinfulness. He doesn't see our brokenness. He doesn't see any of that. He sees that we are forgiven children of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I invite you to rise, and it says God is going to greet us, and then I'll invite us to turn and greet one another. To those who have been called and who are kept by God the Father, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance, both now and forever. Amen. Let's turn and greet one another in the name of Christ.
A few words about some, some things going on this week. First, what a wonderful uh, out, uh, turnout we had for our food truck this last week. Um, and uh, thank you for everyone who came and helped. Uh, looking ahead, we have uh, our soup supper. If you are hungry and if you are a good cook, and, and even if you're a bad cook, please come. Bring your soup and we will all eat together. Uh, and there's... Uh, that's going to be on Saturday, March 18 at 5:30 uh, here in the basement. So uh, if you are if you're free that evening, we'd love to have you come. Uh, yes. Good idea. So there is a sign-up sheet out there, and uh, we don't all want the same kind of, we all don't want cream of broccoli soup, you know, all the same one. I like cream of broccoli soup, but, you know, we want some variety. So make sure when you sign up, make sure you write down what, your, uh, what type of soup you're going to bring, and make sure you take a look at those things. Look at, uh, look at which soup people are bringing. And, uh, of course, we want to be in prayer for, uh, for the family. You, we talked about last week, he passed away. His uh, memorial service will be here at church, uh, and it will be at, on Friday at 11 a.m., so that will be here. There will be a visitation at, uh, at MKD Funeral Home the evening before, 5 to 7.30, and then also um, uh, about an hour, yeah, we'll be meeting here an hour before if you would like to come and visit with the family. Uh, and then also prayers for, uh, for our brother. He's going to be having, he does so much in our church, and he's having knee surgery this Tuesday, so um, somebody else is going to have to come and fix the water pump when it breaks, you know. But let's pray for as well. If you're visiting with us, or if it's been a while, we have a practice, we take a few moments, we quiet our hearts, and uh, prepare ourselves even more for worship coming into God's presence. So let's just take a few moments and do that, and then I will lead us in prayer. Prayer. We come this morning, Lord, because of you. We know that in our heads, that's why we're here. We know that we're coming to hear about you, and we are coming to sing to you. We're coming to see your people, to be together. But there's more than that, Lord. We are here because of you in a, for a deeper reason. It's because you've clothed us with yourself, O Lord Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's you. You've taken yourself and you have draped yourself over us, covering all of our imperfections. You have put yourself on us so that the Father no longer sees us, but he sees you. He sees the perfect Christ. It's no longer I who live, but you, Lord Christ. That's who we are, is this community, Lord. That is why we come. That is why we can come. Not because of what we have done, and most certainly not because of the wrong things we have done. We are allowed to come despite the things that we've done and despite the wrong things we've said, the wrong words we've uttered and the wrong actions that we've done in these weeks. And it's not because of the good things we've done either. It's not because of, of the good works we've done that we can come. We can come because of that simple fact that you now see us in the light of Christ, clothed in Christ as your children. You've now given us the right to be called children of God, not because of what we've done or what we haven't done, but because of what you have done on the cross. It's beneath the cross of Jesus that we stand, as we sang just a little while ago. 
That's where we find our place because you've brought us there. As we've stood there, your blood has flowed down and covered us. You've made us clean, whiter than snow. As we come, I want, Lord, for us to remember this. Help us to remember this. Convict us of this. May we remember who we are, that we are your children, clothed in Christ, covered in his blood, and forgiven, made whiter than snow. If you have forgiven us and seen us in this, we are told, how can we not but do that for each other? If you can see us as washed whiter than snow and forgiven, beloved children of God, how can we not do that for each other? Help us, Lord, to do this. May this be our conviction. Not that what we've done or what we haven't done is what makes us, but you who makes us. That is our only qualification for why we are here As children of God, I thank you that you draw us close to yourself and that you give us the privilege to come and hear you, to come and pray to you, to come and give our cares and concerns to you because you care for us as your children. You say that and you mean it. The words all throughout the Bible of, of you calling us to yourself and calling us your children, those aren't light words. Those aren't things to skip over. Those are real truths. And as your children, we can come to you. Lord, there are many things in our church this week that we can come to you about. Many people we are concerned about. Many we need your care over. Lord, I think about and their family, and the loss of Thank you for the reassurance that he is a child of God, that he knows where he stood, that he, we know where he is. Thank you for the hope that we have, that the family can grasp onto, that this life is not all there is. I pray, too, for our brother as he's having surgery this week. I thank you for him, for all he does in this church, and for all those servants of this community who do so much, so much is done behind the scenes, and much is not seen, Lord, but you see it. Thank you that as your children we may come and worship you, that we may come and, and be your servants, that because of your love for us, because of your cleansing power, that is why we can come and we can serve you, free of condemnation, free of guilt. Thank you for this church community who cares so much for each other and for the world, for our neighborhoods. Thank you that we come month after month doing a food truck for people who struggle. Thank you for the light that that shines. Not our own light, but the light that is already at work in us through you, Lord Jesus. Again, may they not see us, but may they see you clothed over us. Forgiven people who forgive. Unworthy people who have been called worthy. Lord, I want to take a few moments for us. I know there are many concerns. There are many things on people's hearts that need praying. Together we take a few moments just to give those to you silently as your people. We give them to you knowing that you hear us. Let's pray.
Lord, you are good. You've heard us. You've cleansed us of all unrighteousness. And so we can come to you. Lord, thank you for the many gifts you give us. You give us so many things. You give us this church family. You give us our, our building that we can worship in. You give us people who serve you. Lord, you also give us the blessing of finances that we can give back for service to your kingdom. Lord, this morning as we collect for our general fund, for the general operation of our building, and too for uh, earthquake relief, we've heard of earthquakes that have devastated cities far away. And yet we know there are churches there, there is need there, there is love to be shown there, there is you to be shown there. As we collect money for World Renew that goes to uh, help in this effort, we pray that again, it would not be us who is seen, not be, it, that it would be you who people see. And Lord, thank you for our wonderful weekly tradition of collecting a noisy offering for people who, uh, who, who don't have as much, who need food, who we can purchase chickens for, who that will be a blessing. I pray, Lord, for a blessing over all of it, for a blessing over the money that's collected and, and knowing that you bless it because it's not ours, it's yours already. But we pray it would go forward, may it be a blessing. May the world see who you are through it. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the deacons to come forward and collect this morning's offering. And then, of course, the children, if they come and stay up, we'll have our, our noisy offering after that.
Good morning. I'm behind you now. That's different, isn't it? Well, I had something I wanted to ask you. Well, you, you have parents, right? Do you think your parents like it when you do things nicely? Yeah. Do you think so? Well, no, I, I certainly do. You know, we have that talk in our family sometimes, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't take your brother's toys or don't, what else do we talk about? My children, what else kind of nice things do we talk about that we should do in our house? Share, not hit each other, you yeah, know, those are good things, you know. Um, I have another question though. Do you think if you did those things that I would still love you? You think so? Yeah. yeah. But you like it. I, that's true. I might not like it, but do you know what? I would still have love for you. And do you know why I would still have love for you? Because that's not what makes you lovable. What makes you lovable is the very fact that you are my children. That when I'm talking to my two kids, but your parents, I think, would say the same thing. That when we went to the hospital and before you were even born, we loved you so, so much. And it wasn't because of anything you had done yet. It was just because that's who you were. And nothing can change that from a parent to a child. At least it shouldn't. Now, the Bible tells us that God is kind of the same way. Did you know that? The Bible says, before anything happened, he knew you. And he knew who you were. And, and God loved you before you had even done anything good or bad. And God wants you to know that, okay? So, and I want you to know that's how I feel too. About you and everyone in this church. And that's how we should all feel about each other, because that's who we are. We're all children of God. So I'm going to ask, can we pray together really quick? My little brothers and sisters in Christ, let's pray. I thank you, God, that you love us, and that we have parents who love us. And I thank you that even though parents are not always perfect, that we make mistakes, that you, you still love us, God. And that doesn't change. I pray you be with us as we hear more about who you are, about more who you tell us we are. And I pray that you would just remind us of what it is to be a child of God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand up. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. We sing that song sometimes. And you all know the lines. We say, the Lord be with you. Okay, so let's look out there on three. One, two, three. All right, friends, brothers and sisters, you may go down and worship. Last week, before I preached, I had uh, Pastor Paul come up and pray, and I think I might keep that tradition going, though not with Pastor Paul. I asked somebody else to come up and pray, and I'm going to invite Nyla. Sorry, I, I meant to call her yesterday, and I forgot, and so I asked her this morning, and she graciously said yes. And so, before I preach, I think there's something, you know, pastors need praying for, and sometimes it's nice when other people pray for the pastor, so I'm going to ask Nyla to pray for me before I uh, preach the word. Holy Spirit, Sovereign God, you are in this place. You are surrounding this congregation with your Holy Spirit. We have felt it in music. We have felt it in, in uh, uh, prayers. And now, Lord, we ask that you will shower Pastor Chris oh, with your Holy Spirit. Flow it over him, Lord. May he speak your truths. May he speak it loudly. And Lord, we pray that you will penetrate our hearts and our minds with your Holy Spirit and what you want us to know. Thank you for this privilege. Lord, bless Pastor Chris now in this time. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nyla.
So I know we've, had a, we've been going through the same series. Some of you have been with us the whole time, and some of you are just jumping in. So I want to give a little bit of a recap so you know where we are, so today's message will make sense for you, or at least hopefully be meaningful. We've been going through the book of Exodus, this book that we often remember as uh, the, this great story of God bringing the Israelites out of Egypt and rescuing them. And so far, we haven't even gotten to that point yet. We've been going through it for a while. We're not even there. And what we've seen so far is that there's a lot of disappointment. That often we think about Moses as as this great leader who, who does all sorts of great stuff. But if we've been following along, if you've been with us, we've seen he's kind of scared. He's already murdered somebody. Uh, God calls him and says, I want you to do this. And he says, no, three times. He goes and finally gets the courage to do what God tells him to do, and, and then immediately he loses heart. That's what we saw last week. And then today, of all things, we've gotten to this point in the text where, where, where he's just so discouraged, he and Aaron and the people who, who he, he, Moses went and he was going to go to Pharaoh, and, 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 and Pharaoh rejected them, said, nope, I'm not doing what God wants. I don't even know that God that you're talking about. And, and, and it tells us, this is where we ended last week, Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? This is the point in the story we're at. Somebody asked me, are you really going to preach on this next part? It's a list of names and a list of, a list of, a, a list of people. Good news, I'm going to. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get some meaning from it. It's important. It's all about family. So here are these words from Exodus chapter 6, verses 13 through 27. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. These were the heads of their families, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn son of Israel, were Hanak and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. These were the clans of Reuben. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the sons of a Canaanite woman. These were the clans of Simeon. These were the names of the sons of Levi, according to their records. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, Levi lived 137 years. The sons of Gershon by clans were Libni and Shimei. The sons of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. Kohath lived 133 years. The sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi. These were the clans of Levi, according to their records. Amram married his father's sister, Jacobed, who bore him Aaron and Moses. Amram lived 137 years. The sons of Izhar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elzaphon, and Sithri. Aaron married Elisheba, daughter of Aminadab, the sister of Nashan, and she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. The sons of Korah were Asir, Elkanash, and Abiasaph. These were the Korahite clans. Eleazar, son of Aaron, married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phinehas, These were the heads of the Levite families, clan by clan. It was this Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, this same Moses and Aaron. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I should have consulted with our lawyers before I do this. With I don't know if we're going to get booted off of YouTube, but um, you can let me know later, Miles, if that's okay. Because I was thinking about a company slogan, a company that's uh, not too far away from us, right across the, the street over there, not Walmart, but the other one, the orange one, Home Depot. And they've got a saying. It used to be something else, if I remember, but... Uh, 
uh, yeah, it used to be, you can do it, we can help. But uh, they, they have a different phrase now, a different saying. I'll, be, I'll quit. Do you, does anybody know what it is? You watch TV enough or hear it on the radio? Anyway. How doers get more done. Home Depot, how doers get more done. If you need something done, you go to Home Depot. They're going to help you do it. And uh, we have other phrases from things like Nike, just do it. We've got these, uh, we've got these, these things, these, these phrases, and, and it's good to be industrious. It's good to be, uh, it's good to be uh, people who work and get things done and be effective. I'm thankful for people who get things done. I made a mistake on my car this last week when I was involving uh, installing roof rails, and through the help of two gentlemen in our church, they rectified my problem and covered my sins. I was thankful for them. Doing things is really great. We have, uh, we have a culture, I think, in the United States of getting things done, being industrious. Those are good things. How doers get more done. The problem is when we begin to identify people primarily by what they do or what they haven't done. If we begin to identify people by their successes and their failures, at least primarily, it's not wrong to look at those things, but when we do that, when we begin to see people as just the total sum of what they've done or haven't done, at least in the church, that begins to be a problem. If we're looking at Moses so far, we probably wouldn't see him as a very good Home Depot employee. He hasn't done much, actually. If, if we were looking at Moses so far, if we were looking at what he's done and his accomplishments and his successes, well, he'd be, on the, on the, in, he'd be in the red. He wouldn't be in the green. He'd be in the red. He hasn't really been very successful. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, he, God calls him. At first, before even God calls him, he murders somebody. And even before that, he was born and he was, he was put into a basket. He was rescued not by his own hands or not by his own power. He was rescued by the grace of God. And, and then God comes to him. And I told you, I love this passage when God comes to Moses in, in the burning bush. And, and God says, hey, Moses, I'm calling you. And Moses says, mm, I don't think so. Three times. And finally, go, Moses tells God, you got the wrong guy. I'm not going to do it. And then finally, Moses gets up the courage. He goes and he talks with Pharaoh here. If we went back a chapter to, or two chapters, chapter 5, verse 1, Moses and Aaron, these two men who God have called, they go and they finally get up the courage to say, uh, Pharaoh, this is what God says. And by the, end of the, the, uh, by the end of the passage, the end of the verses, they're discouraged. And they back down and they've lost hope. They haven't kept up the faith. Moses has not been a very good Home Depot employee so far. He hasn't gotten a lot done. Now, we have to consider this, especially in light of our passage here. We've got all this stuff that's happened so far. It's been this continuous story of what God has been doing and what Moses has been doing and, and, and the stuff that God, Moses has followed through on. And it ends right here with this, this, this saying, he's just really discouraged. He says, I don't get it, God. I, I, Moses is saying, I, I don't think I can do this. Chapter Verse 12. Moses and Aaron, these two great leaders, they've They've kind of given up at this point, and who can blame them? They've confronted a world power, and they've been bold, and it hasn't worked out immediately like they wanted it to. If we are judging them or looking at them, at Moses and Aaron, and saying, we're going to think you're qualified because of what you've done, if, if that's why you're here, if that's why we're reading about you, then we're going to be really disappointed because they haven't done anything really yet. They're in the red. problem is so often we grab on to that kind of mentality though many of you have commented on how you've been surprised as we've looked closely at this just how badly Moses has done and how he's he's not really been a hero like we've often learned in children's bibles 
I would suspect that there's some element of this that works its way into our day in and day out of really valuing success in the way that we see it doing and getting more done as a primary value in ourselves and in each other. Home Depot employees, doers who get more done. The problem with that is that if we're looking at Moses, he's not qualified. He's done nothing. And so that's what we've seen so far and we come to this point and we might want an explanation. This repeated failure of Moses, why? Why, why did you call him God? Why is he here? Is he the right person? We have to understand that uh, we understand that we typically call these first five books of the, of the Bible by tradition. Moses wrote them, but they were uh, probably written and compiled. Moses probably wrote some of the parts of them, and then they were compiled later for people to read to gain encouragement. Encouragement about who God is and what he's doing. And if they get to this point in the story, needing encouragement, I'm not sure how encouraged they're going to be. Because Moses hasn't gotten more done. And so I think God knows that. And so what does he do in his wonderful wisdom? But he gives us a genealogy. Why are you laughing, Deb? No. <laughs> it is funny. It should be to us. It's okay. I'm just joking. Yeah, we, 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 we get to this and we think, well, if we're that discouraged, if the people are that discouraged, why in the world would God give us this list of names? That's not what I necessarily want to hear to be encouraged. I, I want to hear, don't worry, Moses, you can do it. Don't worry, Moses, he'll get, don't worry, you can do it. Don't worry, you pull yourself together. It'll be good. You'll be a doer who gets more done. And instead, God does this, and he gives us a genealogy. Why? There's two reasons. There's, a, uh, 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 there's two main reasons. I'm going to talk about the second one. The first reason is, is uh, well, first, this is a reminder of what's going to happen. Notice if we read this carefully, it tells about what happens in the future. It's a, a promise of, don't worry, this is going to work out all right. Not by Moses' doing, but by God's doing. It, it's going to work out okay because, because, well, we'll see. There's these great heroes of the faith. If you go and read further in the Bible about, about Phineas and uh, the sons of Korah who, are, uh, who are, are rebellious, and then eventually God uses them in the long run. And if you look at your Psalms, a number of these people are uh, people who write these Psalms. And, and so there's a, lo a longer, different sermon about how God uses these people into the future and how God is redeeming. And, and that's a good message, but I want to focus on the other reason. The other point of a genealogy here. And the point of the genealogy here, the second point, it's all about the qualifications of Aaron and Moses. The author goes out of his way to make sure that we know it is this Aaron and Moses. This one who you've read about so far, this one, these ones who have messed up and lost faith in the very beginning. Now, Lord spoke, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites, and then at the end, it really goes out of its way. They were the ones, Aaron and Moses, who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which we read about last week and the week before, and failed about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. This same Moses and Aaron, in case you're confused, it's these same ones, these ones you've counted as failures. Why? Why is this here? Well, genealogy is important because it reminds the readers of somebody's true qualifications. It reminds the hearers of who is doing the qualifying and where their value truly lies. 
It's not because of what they've done. It's, it's not because of, of their failures even. It's not even because of, of what they will do. It's not because of the fact that they went and they were faithful and that they went to Pharaoh even though it was scary. And it wasn't even the fact that they were obedient in some small things. Those weren't the qualifications. The qualifications that they have are that they are a part of the family of God. Despite their failures, despite where they've come from, despite what they've done, despite what they haven't done, this is their primary qualifier. That they come from the families that God has covenanted with and said, these are the people I promise to love and to care for and to bring them through. And so we have to go back in history, the author says, and say, let me remind you who these people really are. Let me remind you that they come from the lines of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who I covenanted with, who I promised to be faithful to, and that is their qualifier. That is why they're here. despite their failures and their whatevers, despite all the things they have or have not done, that's not what brings them here. What brings them here is the fact that God has called them a part of his family. He wants us to know, God wants us to know this so much that he puts this entire genealogy in the middle of this story, breaking it up as a reminder of who they are. First and foremost. And do you know what that means? It means like Moses and like Aaron, if you are a part of the family of God, it isn't what you do that qualifies you. It isn't what you've done. It isn't if you've messed up. It isn't if you're imperfect. That's not your primary qualifier. Rather, your primary qualifier is that God has called you his his child. I think I read this a few weeks ago, but I'm going to read it again. It's from 1 John 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. That's what we are, the text says. That's who Moses is, and that's who Aaron is, and that's who you are. Children of God. Not because of what you've done, left undone. Not because of the mistakes you've made. Not because of your past. Not because of the things you're currently doing. That's not what qualifies you. It's that God has called you his children. That is so important to remember because that shapes everything we do and everything we say. When we wake up and look at the mirror in the morning, what do we first see? Somebody who will get more done or is a beloved child of God? God would tell you one thing. What do you tell yourself? Or how about the way we look at each other? When we go up to somebody and talk to them, what do we first see? Somebody who will do something or somebody who is a beloved child of God? Unqualified on their own for sure, but loved by God the Father, brought into this family we call the church. We are members of one family, one people, I love Jesus has this line that many people quote. It was even on my, uh, people who aren't Christian quote it. People people know this, but do unto others as you would want done done to you. 
Often we think about that in terms of how we treat people, how we help people, how we do things in, the, in our lives, how we do nice things for people, how we show kindness to each other. But I think there's something deeper there because he's saying, first, before you go and do that to somebody else, you have to ask, how would you want to be treated? Is your greatest longing and desire to be asked, what did you do this week? Because with that also comes, how did you mess up this week? What did you do and what didn't you do? What did you do wrong? Do you want that to be your greatest qualifier? Is that the primary way that we really, truly, deeply want to be known? That I'm a failure, I'm not good enough, Moses is a screw-up, Aaron, he doesn't have it together, and he hasn't acted right. Is that the primary way that we want to be treated? Or is there something else? My guess is there's something else. That something else is what we call the gospel. That you are forgiven, loved, children of God, loved by God before you did anything to deserve it. Loved by God after you did something wrong, known that you were forgiven before you even made a mistake, known that there is no condemnation for you. I don't know about you, but that's the primary way I would want to be seen. How then shall we live is a question we often ask in the Reformed tradition. How then shall we live? What do we do with this? Well, first, I think we need to really truly understand what does God say of you? Who are you? Are you what you do or are you who God says you are? Embrace that truth. I would encourage you. Read these passages. When you come to a genealogy, don't skip over it. Remember that it means you're not a, an employee who gets more done. You're a beloved child of God in the family of God because God says so. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you call us children of God and that in this we can rejoice and be glad that we can see ourselves first and foremost as your beloved children, that this is who we are, clothed in your blood, Lord Jesus, forgiven and loved. Lord, as we interact with each other, may we see the same image. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And that even when we mess up, we are still your children, seen as that in its entirety, washed whiter than snow, not a lighter shade of red, but completely white, even whiter, made clean and blameless in the blood of Christ. I pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. I invite us to rise to sing the church's one foundation. Let's rise to sing.
We go from here is the family of God, and part of the reason I love this song, My Friends May Grow in Grace, is it is a reminder. It's not just something we're singing to God, it's something we're singing to each other. We're calling each other friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, all under the same blood and under the same cross, standing there together. So as we go from here, and as we raise our voices together, go with this blessing from God. May the love of God the Father, the forgiveness of Jesus the Son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.